hello everyone and uh, welcome to our webinar on uh, the politics of urban heat in uh, South Asia. I am Professor Noshin Anwar and I'm a city and regional planner based in Pakistan at a public sector university called the Institute of Business Administration. And uh, I work in the Department of Social Sciences and I'm also the direct founder and director of the Karachi Urban Lab. It has been an immense pleasure and a privilege for me to have helped curate five essays for the recently published Spotlight issue in the International Journal for Urban and Regional Research on extreme heat in South Asia. And I would like specifically to thank Dr. Lisa Weinstein, who is really the powerhouse behind all the spotlight, all the energy and the initiatives uh, on, uh, on the spotlight related publications for IGER. And I would also like to thank the Indian Institute for Human Settlements for sponsoring this uh, webinar today. First, uh, before we dive into uh, listening to our speakers, um, we have uh, a wonderful set of speakers today. I would like to say, I would like to highlight, uh, say about three, three to four different points on, on why uh, we feel it is necessary to focus uh, our conversations today on issues of extreme heat as these are specifically related to South Asia. So the IPCC Working Group 6 Assessment Report on Impacts, Adaptation and Vulnerability has emphasized that if greenhouse gas emissions are not rapidly eliminated, then increasing heat and humidity, and humidity is, a, is now increasingly playing a very complicated and lethal role in how we understand the impacts of extreme heat on the human body, that these will create conditions that test human tolerance. And this means greater exposure to dangerous thresholds of excessive heat, and the human body's physiological capacity to regulate temperatures compromised by the rapid increases in heat gain. So this year alone, soaring temperatures of 43.5 Celsius have killed more than 200 people in the Indian states of Uttar Pradesh and Bihar, uh, with morgues full and hospitals over capacity. In 2015, a deadly heat wave killed more than 1,200 people in Pakistan's largest city in Karachi. So South Asia is increasingly very much sort of a hotspot for extreme heat related issues. Secondly, there has been limited in-depth and qualitatively rich research on extreme heat and its impacts on cities and vulnerable inhabitants, especially in South Asia. But the frequency of annual extreme temperatures, heat waves and related deaths across the world is increasing and can no longer be ignored. Now, the speakers featured today who have written those five wonderful essays in the recently published Spotlight issue, um, their work emphasizes the need for in-depth qualitative research by foregrounding the structural inequalities, differential vulnerabilities, and urban planning failures that have contributed to the effects of extreme heat. Thirdly, at the city level, the risks are significant. In Pakistan, in May 2022, the city of Jacobabad, with a population of 191,000 in the southern region of Sindh, recorded six days when the wet bulb globe temperature, or what is called the WBGT, which is a more accurate measure of extreme heat impacts, exceeded the limit of human survivability, which is generally understood at around 35 Celsius. Since human skin temperature averages close to 35 Celsius, WBGTs above that critical value prevent people from dispelling internal heat, leading to what physiologists generally underscore as fatal consequences within a matter of six hours, even for healthy people in well-ventilated conditions or in shape. Now, climate change is devastating environments and altering especially the thermal contexts of already marginalized, marginalized inhabitants. For instance, within urban South Asia, people living in informal settlements, in slums, in low-income settlements, and so forth, which are generally environments where we see critical infrastructure failures or infrastructural back, uh, breakdowns, especially in relation to issues of electricity, the provision of water, ventilation, and even shade. So a key, a key question that I have posed in my introduction section to the spotlight issue is this. Is extreme heat turning South Asian cities into sweat boxes, especially in a context where legacies of planning failures, socio-spatial inequalities, and disconnected infrastructures are exacerbating thermal exposure by weaponizing the built environment as it heats up? So our speakers today address this question, not only in the essays, but will do so today as in, in terms of, um, of, of, of the discussions. These are established and emerging scholars who reflect on the impacts of rising heat in South Asia. And they address several critical issues pertaining to the unique challenges that rising temperatures pose for urban South Asia and the harms imposed on poor marginalized and vulnerable inhabitants. 
These harms include direct and indirect impacts, such as rise in old and new chronic disease burdens, worsening respiratory conditions, heat stress-related injuries, displacement, and infrastructural damage. So with that, I would like to now introduce the speakers. And I will introduce the speakers in the context of the lineup in terms of how uh, one, two, three, four, how you know, each one, as one finishes, the other uh, comes on board. So we start with the first speaker, who is Dr. Chandni Singh. Uh, Chani is a senior research consultant at the School of Environment and Sustainability in the Indian Institute for Human Settlements, Bangalore, India. She is working at the interface of climate change and development in rural and urban geographies within the Global South. And she has also been uh, a key contributor to the IPCC 6 assessment report. Our second speaker is uh, Dr. Ashavari Chaudhary, who is a visiting assistant professor in the Department of Science and Technology Studies at Cornell University. And her research is at the intersections of the environment, health, and science. Our fourth speaker is Ms. San, uh, Sajani Kandal, who is a PhD candidate in, in the School of, of the Environment at the University of Massachusetts, Boston. And her scholarly work intersects environmental science, climate science, and resiliency planning, and uses interdisciplinary climate justice approach to redistribute expertise in heat resiliency decision making. She contributed to the spotlight issue alongside her colleague, uh, Ms. Sharmila Shantan, who is a PhD student in Development and Sustainability Program at the Asian Institute of Technology University in Thailand. Next is our speaker, Dr. Adam Abdullah, who is actually my colleague and at the IBA. He's a social director of the Karachi Urban Lab and an assistant professor of urban planning in the Department of Social Sciences and Liberal Arts. And he co-authored the essay with my other colleague, who is Ms. Suha Maktoum, who is an architect and a social director at Karachi Urban Lab. Finally, we have our speaker, Dr. Alok Kandekar, who is assistant professor of anthropology, sociology, and an adjunct professor of climate change at the Indian Institute of Technology, Hyderabad, and his current research investigates climate and environmental governance in the urban global south. And alongside him, his co-authors for the Spotlight uh, essay are uh, uh, Dr. Anand Mariganti, who hardly needs any introduction, who is the director of the very famous Hyderabad Urban Lab Foundation and member of the international team studying the impact of heat on off-grid localities and cities of the global south, as well as Anushri Gupta, who is a PhD scholar at the Department of Liberal Arts in IIT Hyderabad, and Tanaya Bhowal, who is a social researcher studying heat wave exposure and off-grid settlements of cities in, in the global south. So with this, I, I invite uh, Dr. Asha, uh, Dr. Chani Singh to kick off uh, our discussion as she is the first speaker. And each speaker will have 10 minutes. Thank you. And I would like each speaker then to introduce the next speaker. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Nosheen, and for setting the context and also for the opportunity to contribute to this spotlight series, which I think is really important. And there are lots of lessons um, and warnings, I think, from South Asia on heat that we offer to the world, but also to uh, countries and neighboring regions. Uh, thanks so much. So um, I'm going to touch upon about four or five points. Uh, I don't have slides, so I'll be just talking through them. Um, I think the, the context that Noshin's uh, sort of set out for us is, is so crucial of this, uh, the, the recognition that heat as a hazard is increasing exponentially. But often people talk about this as if it's something that we didn't expect, as if it's new. And uh, what the climate science has been saying for a very long time with a lot of certainty is that heat as a hazard is going to increase. Unlike the kinds of projections we have for precipitation or rainfall, uh, which is a lot more uncertain. The, the South Asian monsoon is very difficult to predict. There are very clear trends, both in the past and then going into the future about extreme heat. Uh, but if we try to then nuance that a bit to understand how is really this heat, uh, the hazard of heat really changing, we know with a lot of certainty, again, the nature of this hazard is going to change. So you've got, um, a lengthening of the, the period in which you have heat waves, so longer uh, and larger number of days where we're going to see extreme heat. We have um, heat waves coming earlier in the year, and a clear example of that was the May March 2022 heat wave across India and Pakistan, where we saw temperatures of uh, up to 42 degrees in March, which is the peak uh, harvest season of wheat, which is such an integral crop for, for South Asia. So, uh, so we have a lengthening of the season, we have it coming earlier, and then something that's not spoken as much about, which is that the hazard is also uh, um, not only daytime temperatures and extremes in 
uh, daytime uh, heat, but also nighttime temperatures going up. And the, the metric that is used is cumulative hot days and hot nights. And hot nights are particularly important because we know that the body that is exposed to extreme heat in the daytime actually recuperates in the night. And especially in low income informal settlements, uh, nighttime temperatures actually have been shown to be not cooling down to the levels that enable the body to cool down. And so you've got this, this chronic heat going on from morning to evening and for very long periods of time. So I think why I highlight this is to say that we need to understand that the hazard of heat itself is increasing, but the nature of it is changing. And therefore the kinds of strategies we or solutions we propose to deal with this also needs to change. The second bit of the story around heat risk is of course exposure. And we, we know from our own lived experience, of course, but also a lot of literature showing that exposure to this changing hazard is also highly differentiated. So, I mean, if you look at it globally, I think people in, in South Asia have always uh, been living with uh, high heat, especially in the summer months. Uh, but again, because these hazards are coming at um, different times and the periods that people are being exposed to them are lengthening, uh, there's something that's changing in the nature of that exposure. And we need to really think about that again when we, when we are sort of visualizing solutions or heat adaptation. And then third thing, which, which is what I really delve into a little more detail in the, in the spotlight uh, essay that I wrote is, all of this is overlaid on people's existing vulnerabilities, whether it's based on gender, who you are, uh, your age, where you live, the kind of housing you, you uh, inhabit, the kinds of jobs and livelihoods you are involved in, and the kinds of capacities you really have to cool your spaces or even protect yourself from outdoor heat. And this is um, uh, Jesse Rebo in his uh, lovely paper called Vulnerability Does Not Fall From the Sky really makes this argument that current vulnerability is sort of assessed through these assessments that are surveys that have indicators and metrics to capture vulnerability. But we know very clearly that they sort of overlaid on histories of marginalization. There are certain people who live in certain localities that belong to certain castes and belong to certain livelihoods. So it's not that vulnerability just falls from the sky, but there are these deep histories of marginalization on which then heat as a hazard, you know, uh, comes up and then uh, exacerbates this vulnerability. And why in this conversation, I mean, uh, there's 40 years or much more, I would say, from different disciplines of uh, literature on vulnerability and its differentiated nature. I think what the literature is now moving towards to also argue that all these axes of vulnerability, whether it's gender, age, uh, your health status, or your assets, all of that actually are intersecting to shape um, vulnerability that is actually very dynamic. And so these metrics that we have to assess vulnerability sometimes are inadequate and do not that vulnerability changes. Um, just to give you an example, if, if you've got a new, um, a new large construction coming up in your neighborhood that actually uh, reduces some of the green cover in the area, that is going to affect your exposure and therefore then is going to affect uh, the level to which you you experience heat. So those kinds of things, and often the agency and the power that people have to make decisions about uh, how how your neighborhood is developing is very different if you if you don't have um, uh, security over the land that you you are living on and things like that. So this this layering of vulnerability and exposure is really shaping this overall um, risk of heat. Uh, then. Uh, we we this is part of the problem in trying to understand uh, why some people are more vulnerable to heat. But then, what do we do with that understanding? And that is where we start moving to the solution space and really thinking about what are the solutions that that cities across the region are really proposing. And I can speak from India that we have a range of heat action plans in various cities across the country, and they are in various levels of I would say. Um, implementation, but also sophistication. Some of them are uh, simply copied from one another, but some actually have been very innovative. For example, I know Ahmedabad as a city comes up repeatedly as an example of being an innovative and an early innovator in heat action, urban heat action plans. 
But from analyzing around 38 to 40 of these heat action plans, which were different scales, states, a state level, city level, and some even at district level um, units, what we see, what we found is that only three of them actually have any kind of vulnerability assessment detailed in the heat action plan. So the solutions that tend to be offered are often very generic. And that that is a sort of red flag because how can if if the underlying nature of the city is so differentiated, how can the solutions not be targeted to address that differentiation? So I think that is something that we in our research, but also of course other people including civil society organizations in India have been really advocating for that we need robust uh, multi-dimensional vulnerability assessments first to create maps of uneven heat of the city and then finally of course target our solutions based on it. Uh, so while there are these actions that sometimes are blind to underlying vulnerabilities, there's also a need to recognize that capacities to adapt or capacities to really manage this heat risk are also unequal. So there's an inequality or both from the side of the problem, but also when you start trying to uh, invest in and uh, engage with solutions around heat, there is there are inequities. I mean, just to highlight some of them, first of all, not everybody has the same capacity to pool their spaces, whether they're workspaces or spaces at home. Um, and so this whole idea of active cooling and air conditioning as a way to deal with heat actually doesn't work in, in the South Asian context for a very large population. And unfortunately, that population is also the one that is most vulnerable. A second axis of inequity when it comes to solutions is that uh, access to green spaces, whether public or private, are again differentiated by income level, housing type, um, and often caste also in India. So that means that, uh, again, thinking about this euphoria around nature-based solutions as a way to sort of uh, deal with heat in our cities is perhaps a bit um, premature. And I think it, it doesn't really, it, it might work in more uh, homogeneous conditions, but doesn't work in uh, our large and highly unequal cities. Um, so a way forward, I think, and I'm happy to even discuss this when we have time in the end, is really that there are, um, uh, we need to start thinking about processes that allow people who are most ex exposed to heat also participate in this visioning of solutions to heat, which currently isn't happening. The heat action plans are often very top down. There is some amount of community engagement, but understandably these, these documents still remain standard operating procedures of different government departments actually deploying actions. Um, and I think what needs one way forward is perhaps starting to envision co-created adaptation pathways to heat, where it's not only one set or one particular solution that one is offering, but for different temperature levels and different exposure levels, we start thinking of different pathways of uh, that cities or neighborhoods can take to adapt to heat. And finally, just to end, I'd like to say that I think this year in particular for me, at least 2023 has been this moment where everyone is suddenly talking about heat. And I, I wonder, uh, I, oh, I am surprised at everyone discovering heat this year, especially in the temperate world. And I feel that the tropical world has a lot to offer in terms of public memory, in terms of experience, and in terms of solutions of how to deal with heat. So this is really an opportunity for us to, first of all, consolidate some of these local practices of dealing with heat, but also recognizing their limits because the hazard itself is changing. So uh, that's that's the, instead of uh, getting absolutely uh, uh, overwhelmed by this, this uh, narrative, because it can lead to so much gloom about uh, increasing heat, perhaps we also need to think about what, what strengths this long history of dealing with heat offers South Asia. Thanks so much. And over to the next speaker. Thank you so much, Chandni. Um, that was really a uh, wonderful. And the last point that you made is a is a great uh, way to segue to my presentation, which is indeed. Um, about the history of the relation between environmental heat and the body um, in South Asia. 
Um, so should I just start? Um, uh, should I just start sharing screen? And okay, I'll I'll just be in the. Um, okay. Um, so um, again, I think my interest in heat, uh, in this relation between the heat and the body, um it began, it kind of emerged when I was part of the Asia Research Institute. Um, and there was a conference in um, a conference uh, called Heat in Urban Asia, Past, Present and Future. And following from where um, Chandi ended, I think I was always um, interested to understand this um, liminality between heat being ubiquitous in the South Asian context, but at the same time, um, uh, invisible and or catastrophic. So I was interested, A, to think of other um, ways of thinking about heat that are outside of the framework of climate change and catastrophe, because, um, um, you know, like, uh, like the last speaker mentioned that uh, in, in temperate zones, now that heat waves are um, becoming more um, uh, frequent, that is how conversations about heat are kind of uh, emerging in a certain way. They are becoming a thing, but in places like South Asia, experiences, practices, um, thinking around and about heat has a very long history, right? So what does that long history do or not do um, to the present um, uh, moments of extreme heat and heat waves. So that was um, that was one of the questions I was interested in. And for that conference, I presented and wrote a paper on the concept of heat in Ayurveda because in Ayurveda, heat um, is not catastrophic. It is it is just a, a very important building block of um, understanding health and disease. And heat is not thought of in terms of temperature it's a it's a it's a quality it's it's a studied in terms of function of combustion of food transformation of su substances and there are some similarities with um yunani as well um in the south asian context but kind of um moving back to um this uh this webinar and and the set of articles that um uh that, that we all um, wrote around heat in um, South Asia. Again, going back to my initial point, I was always interested in this paradox of heat and, and the body having a very long history in South Asia, but at the same time, um, India and, and other South Asian countries are one of the most vulnerable um, uh, to heat, extreme heat conditions in the present moment. So in March 22, India experienced the most severe heat waves in over a century. Climate change has made the occurrence of such heat waves 30 times more likely. The prolonged and widespread heat waves when uh, temperatures rose to up to 50 degrees Celsius severely affected millions of people, animals, agriculture, especially the wheat harvest that um, received a hard blow due to the heat waves uh, coinciding with the harvest season. The Indian Meteorological Department considers the onset, onset of heat wave when the temperature rises above 40 degrees Celsius in plains and above 30 degrees Celsius in hill stations and or when the departure from normal temperature in a place is between 4.5 degrees Celsius to 6.4 degrees and anything beyond this increase is considered severe heat wave. Yet these numbers cannot adequately hold the visceral experiences of bodies enduring heat and the social and political meanings that get inscribed on different bodies. Uh, so one of the questions uh, that I have been following, and again, it's a very new project. So all, all your comments, especially from um, those of you uh, like Chadni, Alok, and some others who are working um, in thinking about in, in, in action plans and, um, uh, and, and, and in the urban context, I, um, I, I would be, I have been, um, I, I would really um, uh, welcome comments from all of you. But one question that I've been following is, how have scientific practices and disciplines addressed heat in South Asia 
and how has environmental heat um, forged relations with the body during di different historical moments in India? Um, so um, very briefly, and my article goes into uh, more details um, on each of these points, but uh, Mughal architecture, so uh, during the Mughal period, architecture uh, was, this, was not only the seat of grandeur and the sublime, vaulted and doomed roofs, lattice screen, thick walls, arch ceilings prevented the absorption of summer's vertical sun, keeping the inner surfaces cool. The sun shades along with verandas formed a liminal space between the inside and the outside, and water channels and fountains that were based on the principles of evaporative cooling carefully managed the microclimate of the place. So, um, so there is uh, there is writing on um, the significance of architecture that was kind of the um, one of the primary disciplines and and uh, uh, sort of uh, administrative practices where heat and and its relation with the body was um, articulated um, very explicitly, and. Um, and there was a shift uh, during the colonial period where along with architecture, um, uh, there, were, there were also writings, uh, 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 a lot of inquiries, research and writings in medicine about uh, the relation between European bodies, um, Indian slash South Asian bodies and their different or similar relationship to heat. Um, yeah, so from the 19th century onwards, medicine uh, not replaced, but medicine kind of became another site where uh, heat was discussed at, at length. As Suman said, writes in Difference and Disease, the question that perplexed travelers from Britain to places like India, West Africa and elsewhere was uh, why they were, uh, fell sick and when they arrived and why was the illness never so severe once they recovered? By the 19th century, medicine could um, not be abstracted from the broader colonial order where the body became the site of authority and control of colonial power, as well as its repudiation by the colonized, a process that David Arnold terms as the corporeality of colonialism. The body as a location of power and resistance or a site where Western and Indian primarily Ayurveda and Yunani medicine could lay their claims was far from being a clear separation between the, that of the colonizer and the colonized, especially in the context of epidemic diseases like cholera, smallpox, uh, smallpox and plague. There were layers of meanings and even opposing readings of the body, as well as dialectical and pluralistic relations between Western and Indian medicines, instead of each being a closed entity, or an absolute form of knowledge. With ideas of porosity of bodies that were affected by the immediate environments informing colonial medicine in the 19th century, the conceptual space of the tropics constructed places and people in India as different from temperate places like Europe. Um, so again, there are uh, there, a lot of the archival materials and, and writings based on the colonial period is really trying to understand whether there is a fundamental difference in European bodies and um, and bodies of um, uh, communities and people living in the tropics and and how might uh, how how that changed the the tolerance to heat and again uh, like uh, the last speaker pointed out none of these are none of these assumptions really stop at heat in terms of temperature, right? There are the, the, the associations that um, uh, 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 colonial researchers uh, uh, had about temperate climate were transposed onto bodies of people who were living there. So there, there's always a value judgment. Um, there's, a, there's always an evaluation about um, climate and what that means for that place, but also for the people who live there. Um, in the post-colonial period for a long time in the 50s and 60s, one can find um, writings on uh, technologies, so technologies of comfort uh, like air conditioner, refrigerator, um, uh, they, they 
they try to become uh, a, a, an important part of um, South Asian practice and imaginary. And like um, uh, some of this, uh, some of the authors have written, and and um, uh, others have also written that that is still very uh, small, right? Like the 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 work on air condition, the the access to air conditioning and um, refrigerator. Um, refrigerators or other uh, infrastructures of thermal comfort are still very limited but there is a uh, one can see a um, uh, sort of um, the 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 kind of division between colonizer and the colonized and the associations with um, different bodies during the colonial period there are resonances of those ideas in the post colonial period but now it the, the category becomes through class Right, so so you have um, uh, newspaper articles on how um, uh, these infra technologies and infrastructures of thermal comfort should not only be limited to a certain class, but it should reach out to everyone um, in in the country because um, again that became a signifier of modernization. So India doesn't need to lag behind uh, compared to other countries. So it should kind of surpass the physical uh, you know, discomfort. But there were also um, sort of signification and, um, and, and references to class when it came to um, uh, these um, technologies of comfort in the post-colonial period. And um, also, um, I mentioned briefly in my article, uh, and um, I, I uh, intend to do um, ethnographic work in the next few years on the heat action plans that um, that became uh, that that are that have become significant uh, in the in the past few years. Um, So uh, the, in, in the past decade, the quotidian experiences of sweltering summer days have been coupled with extreme heat conditions and recurrent heat waves. It is only recently that the central government has been actively involved with addressing heat conditions. Um, so the Indian Meteorological Department and National Disaster Management Authority started working last year with 23 out of 28 states that are considered as exist existing and potential sites for extreme heat waves. The project drew heavily um, from the lessons from Ahmedabad city, like we heard um, just now a few minutes back, um, heat plan, action plan of 2013. So, uh, so there were, um, so part of the, these action plans were organization of virtual uh, national workshop on prevention, preparedness, mitigation, and management of heat waves by bringing together researchers, policymakers, and representatives from national um, level ministries, non-governmental and intergovernmental organizations to form an action plan for the country. It has also collaborated with um, different institutions and, and under this plan, different states approach the urgent crisis in different ways. Uh, so for instance, Gujarat created multi-level district state village action plans that included ad adopting um, cool roof technologies, making a plan to restrict climate warming emissions, trying to reduce heat related to illnesses. Andhra Pradesh, another um, Southern Indian state, um, with highest number of people affected by heat every year inform citizens to avoid being outdoors between 11 a.m. to 5 p.m., adjusted school timings and took extra precaution to protect pregnant women. And several districts in the state made oral rehydration salt available for people on the streets and built water coolers in public spaces. So there are so different um, cities and, and different heat action plans address the issue of heat differently. So that's something, um, um, you know, like uh, like we were hearing just now that the, the, the imagination of vulnerability has, has to be kind of, you know, um, inter, intersectional and, and kind of overlapping and multi-layered. And accordingly, there have been um, different um, approaches to heat action plan. Um, Asha Ashabari, Ashabari yeah, I, I, I hate to interrupt, but we are now be, uh, beyond, beyond 10 minutes, actually. Oh, okay, so I'm going so, to yeah. just wrap up. Thank so you. I think, thank yeah, you. no, yeah, thank you so much. I, I cannot look at the chat when I'm talking. I, I lose the thread. So thank you for uh, 
thank you for reminding me of that. So I think, um, so again, going going back to where I started, and and that really is the center. Um, uh, one of the one of the central questions in in the project that I'm um working on um, is that um, heat has a very long history and its relationship with the body. But at the same time, uh, India and other South Asian places are also the most vulnerable, right? So at what moment heat becomes unbearable or, or uh, so in a way, I mean, it's not, a, it's, not, it's not working as a privilege that we have such a long history. It's, it's maybe, we are maybe, um, sort of overlooking the urgency uh, in a way. So what are these thresholds and moments when, you know, heat becomes something that is, that needs urgent attention along with the quotidian practices, scientific or otherwise, um, that contribute towards this re relation between heat and the body. That's just my big project that I'm, um, that I have been working on since a while. Thank you. And sorry for being going over time. That's okay. Thank you so much, Ashavari. Our next speaker is uh, Sajani Kendal. Sajani, please uh, go ahead. Uh, thanks, Nasin. Uh, uh, hi, everyone. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank Nasin and Lisa for uh, facilitating this highly important conversation around heat, uh, mainly in the South Asian context. So I've been working uh, in extreme heat domain for like more than five years now. And and when I first started working in this, uh, the one of the question that I stumbled upon was uh, why extreme heat is uh, not prioritized in planning and governance compared to other climate change disaster. And it was very fascinating for me to see, like even because I'm I was based in Boston for my education, and it was very fascinating for me to see even in the most uh, climate change proactive cities in global north, planning and governance around extreme heat was often blurred and were reactive in many ways and. Uh, and this, as I started to sort of like transcend my research to my home country, Nepal, this was very much true for, for Nepal as well. And not only there was this lack of uh, urgency to work towards heat action in Nepal, but also there was this non-existence conversation of extreme heat around Nepal in heat scholarship. Uh, heat is not new for Nepal, like other speakers have talked about it in the South Asian context in India. Uh, heat has been a regular part of a southern climate in Nepal, uh, which borders India and where temperature can go to extreme. Uh, every year there will be news, and I remember this uh, every time, like when I was growing up, uh, there used to be news of heat related deaths in the region. Uh, and with climate change, uh, it's going severe. So, uh, so in this article, which I co-author with my, my colleague, Sarmila, we argue that Nepal has been largely overlooked in the heat conversation due to this uh, global uh, perception of Nepal as this being a mountainous country, and which is reflected in uh, countries' inadequate awareness and also preparedness for heat-related issues in practice. And heat scholarship for many years has also uh, largely focused on this larger urban context, uh, which is driven by urban heat uh, island studies and uh, and semi-urban areas uh, were overlooked, uh, leading to this inadequate, inadequate understanding of the problem and preparedness. And with, like I mentioned, with the climate change, it's gonna be, uh, these areas are gonna be also hit harder. And this is where uh, me and Sarmila first started thinking together what it means for the most marginalized residents in, uh, in Nepal. To cope, cope off with extreme heat events. So this essay in the spotlight is our critical commentary on highlighting uh, how Nepal has this growing yet a large unnoticed extreme heat risk. And we reflect on three among many factors that uh, acerbates extreme heat problem in Nepal. And uh, one of the major factors that we talked, uh, talked in the spotlight essay is uh, how government priorities are uh, often skewed towards uh, socioeconomic challenges uh, due to multidimensional poverty, uh, competing development interest, and frequent geological and hydrometeorological disaster that hits Nepal and kills hundreds of residents every year. So uh, among all of these priorities, uh, for government, it's often most really hard to you know, prioritize, prioritize heat in mainstream planning, and which is consistent to the planning practice of many regions around the globe. And it's not new to Nepal. 
sec, it's not like heat has not been in the conversation in Nepal. No, like we have been talking about heat for some time now. And uh, and many in planning and policy discourse, uh, to some extent, there has been some, uh, some plan that has been published. Uh, However, there is this uh, lack of contextual understanding of the problem and which I, uh, Chani did uh, talk about in the Indian context, uh, how communities are being in impacted, what are their heat adaptation needs and preference, and with no planning framework uh, uh, in practice to advance, advance this action plan. Uh, more, and also most often these uh, planning discourse are being, being led by international funders and and our government are highly dependent on uh, them for the financial resources and also for the science and technical competences, uh, uh, which is fine. But more, but 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 most often, like you know, uh, there is this like in, uh, inherent favors of funder priorities that happens uh, over countries' interest, meaning the socioeconomic in, uh, economical and development uh, interest. And this also sort of like portrays lack of government leadership. Uh, to address the issue that is uh, most concerning for our uh, nation and also for the population. And the result of, of uh, this kind of mismatch is that heat intervention uh, that has been largely proposed in this couple of plans has been this uncritically exported lesson from Global North uh, that completely overlooks our uh, historical socioeconomic microclimatic uh, conditions. Uh, one of the example uh, is that there is larger conversation around green roofs and which is fine, but when your population is largely under poverty and are struggling for the basic necessities like clean and safe water, I mean, I mean, having conversation around green roof is I feel like it's we are we are not even thinking about a basic thing that our residents needs here. Uh, we talk about cooling using air conditioners, but how can then that be a primary heat adaptation strategy in a country where we have been struggling with energy crisis for more than two decades now? So uh, we haven't, all this to say is that we haven't been thinking about basic thing that resident needs first for the heat adaptation, but mainly like thinking about these larger adaptation strategies, mainly bordered from different contexts, different socioeconomic contexts and different uh, climatic and story contexts. Uh, the uh, last point we uh, we talk about in the spotlight article is like how our urban planning approach, which has been non-existent for many years, has amplified these impacts. Uh, uh, Nepal is highly centralized. Ma major urban cores have this high, huge population density and because of which there is a lack of planning, uh, which has created range of urban planning issues. We, Like I mentioned, we lack basic urban amenities like safe, clean drinking water. There is huge energy crisis, lack of health and emergency services, particular to the marginalized communities. And I mean, there is no lack of green spaces, no tree canopies uh, that provides any kind of ecological benefit as such. So uh, when, when the urban spaces lack all of these basic urban amenities that require that is required for the population, the shift of the disaster sort of like shift towards uh, most vulnerable residents who are already impacted by poverty. Uh, also, our historical urban planning practices and policies have favored higher class elite group. Uh, resulting in, in, in the resource concentration uh, around the capital city and major hilly urban area. And this uneven distribution acerbates heat related challenges faced by the marginalized community, mainly in the southern plains, where the, uh, where the communities are already facing heat impacts, making them more vulnerable to the extreme heat in the region. So, so this article is more of a call uh, to highlight extreme heat is increasing issue uh, in Nepal and how country need to advance uh, contextual heat planning and then move beyond uh, the, from this motivational discourse uh, more towards this risk informed uh, plan and policy implementation. Uh, like I mentioned, we are in the very early stage of the planning. Lots need to be done here uh, from starting uh, prioritizing data monitoring, empirical study, regional specific threat, heat threat assessment, many more. And at the local level, uh, I'm trying to understand how, how we can safeguard most vulnerable residents. We need to start from basic years. And I mentioned it before as well, like how we can get access 
uh, to clean and safe water, how we can improve early warning system with the clear guidelines for the residents and, and how we can put adaptive resources for the people uh, to be the heat events. Government can't expect residents to stay indoors when residents have to meet their end needs. And hopefully uh, with the basic foundation in place, uh, we can move towards creating more comprehensive, uh, create a comprehensive plan with clear implementation framework. And there is so much to learn from here. Like as I hear and read, uh, as I hear from all of you and read the spotlight article, we can learn from our neighboring country uh, and South Asian cities in general, which share similar climatic history and socioeconomic and governance structure. I mean, we don't have, sort of like copy from Global North, which shares, which has completely different history. Uh, and we also highly believe that forum like this not only provides shared learning, it also brings forward somewhat like obscure issues like heat in Nepal in the forefront in heat scholarship, policy and planning. Thank you. Uh, I believe it's Dr. Adam next. That's correct. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Sajani. That was wonderful. Thank you. Thank you, Sajani. And a lot of what you said also resonates uh, with the conditions of Karachi. So if uh, Tanvi can uh, share my PowerPoint, I will be ready to go. But hello, everyone. In the meantime, I'm Adam Abdullah from Karachi, Pakistan. Um, and I will present the article uh, which I have co-authored with my colleague, Soha Maktoum. And the title of my presentation is, so this is the last page. Uh, if you can just like go to the first page. Yeah, thank you. So the title of my presentation is Heat and Action, the Thermopolitics of Extreme Urban Heat in Karachi. And this brief presentation explores the cognitive constructions of urban heat in Karachi. And we explore how heat manifests and is thought about, imagined and dealt with uh, and how this impacts subsequent actions and inactions at various scales. Uh, so next. So this article is one of the outputs of a GCRF funded project titled Cool Infrastructures on Urban Heat Utilities and Everyday Thermal uh, Perceptions, where we use various kinds of methods and field data. And we find that heat is elusive. It is sometimes uh, exoticized at other times normalized. Um, and on an administrative level, heat is hardly understood as a pervasive urban condition, let alone being effectively planned for. So we investigate the everyday management of urban heat, both at the scale of formal administrative dimensions of heat governance, as it is manifested in various kinds of actions, directives, and discourses, as well as the everyday scale of individual and communal thermal regulation practices of the body, the home, and work environments. Next. So a bit of context, Karachi is located in Pakistan's southern province of Sindh, which has been declared a hotspot for climate change. And Karachi has an official population of about 20 million people. Uh, and climatically, it falls under the Copenhagen BWH category with low altitude, very hot and long summers and mild winters. But over the last 60 years, nighttime temperatures have increased by about 2.5 four degrees uh, centigrade and daytime temperatures by 1.6 degrees. And over the last decade, Karachi has also experienced several extreme heat events. Next. So we start our article with an anecdote. We describe how on a typical May afternoon when the temperature is 42 degrees, our protagonist battered by heat and physically exhausted searches for some form of respite. Uh, of course, the Med Department has already warned him to stay indoors as the city is bound to experience an intense heat wave. Uh, but this person knows that staying indoors is not an option for him as each day spent not working translates into the, days, uh, the loss of a day's wages. Uh, so when he does eventually locate a heat wave camp and quenches his thirst, he then praises and prays for the government, which he believes has set up this heat wave camp. Next. So in the article that we write, we take this anecdote as a point of departure to investigate what kinds of cognitive mechanisms are at work and what kinds of perceptions are built up around heat, which might then compel one to create these imaginaries of who is responsible for what and where the chains and networks of accountability lie when it comes to the management of urban heat. And in writing this, we do not imply a unidirectional flow of accountability 
uh, but are more interested in examining the various ways in which these accountabilities and actions uh, intersect, replace, or get substituted. Next. So one of Pakistan's very few documents on urban heat management is the 2016 Karachi Heat Wave Management Plan, launched after the 2015 heat wave in the city, which officially claimed about 1,200 lives. This heat wave triggered a set of arbitrary, non-coordinated responses by urban political actors and philanthropic organizations. And these actions over time kind of became an ad hoc template for future scenarios of urban heat. But the heat wave management plan remained largely oblivious to the city's pre-existing thermospatial inequalities. And this also resonates with uh, a few things that Chani and Sajani also mentioned, that each region has this specific history of the, uh, thermal inequalities. So I think these thermal inequalities and the history and genealogies of these inequalities, when they interact with social spatial uh, indicators as well, are crucial to understanding the differentiated effects of extreme heat on various kinds of thermally vulnerable urban populations. And so this document eventually came to inaccurately symbolize the understanding of heat for Karachi and indeed for Pakistan, because it lacked those nuances in understanding uh, heat on a disaggregated level. Next. So in terms of conceptualizing heat in action by the various tiers of the state, we complicate the two kinds of visible actions around heat management in the city of Karachi. The first action is the direct, unsolicited, and whimsical delegation of immediate relief provision in terms of a heat event by the state to non-state actors, such as philanthropic organizations and CSR operatives. And the second action is shifting the onus for everyday navigation of heat onto individual subjects, uh, individual urban subjects and households. And both of these kinds of actions, we argue, actually constitute multi-scalar forms of inactions in uh, urban heat governance. Uh, next. So in terms of the first action, uh, which is delegation, while interventions by non-state actors like setting up heat camps and water coolers in public spaces do provide immediate thermal relief, um, such interventions constitute an action framework that is at the scale of a massive city like Karachi arbitrary, subjective, and non-coordinated. Such actions erroneously interpret heat as a discrete and predictable event, and consequently, each relief provider uh, relies on subjective evaluations of and improvisations in the kind of heat mitigation actions that they opt to provide. And these actions, again, are based loosely either on broader organizational protocols or individual convictions of kindness and virtue in terms of uh, the calamity that is heat. Next. The second action involves shifting the onus of managing heat from the state downwards onto gendered individual bodies, such as men working outdoors during peak heat, peak heat hours and women confined within hot and humid domestic uh, spaces. And this is this action is achieved by actively circulating flyers, text messages, pamphlets, which contain heat advisories, as well as specific instructions, such as staying indoors, keeping oneself hydrated, uh, to regulate the thermal rhythms and impacts in the form of a top-down compliance, where, where heat would then become the norm and the state's duty is to inform and warn, and the consequences of actions then lie with individuals. Um, but again, such prescriptions remain far removed from the ground, we observe, in terms of their conception of thermally vulnerable populations, who these are, what resources they have access to, what practices they conventionally draw upon to mitigate heat, and how such practices differ even across populations that might appear homogenous, such as dozens of informal settlements that from afar seem very similar, but are differentiated and disaggregated in their practices and uh, access to utilities. Um, but the state, however, we observe that remains oblivious to such intricacies of everyday practice, employing this shifting strategy to absolve itself of its responsibility towards effective heat action. Uh, next. And herein lies what we term as the farcical element of Karachi's thermopolitics that firstly, it remains temporally circumscribed 
to specific thermal events that punctuate these urban governance imaginaries, discounting the pervasive and chronic nature of urban heat. Hence, action and inaction, which are usually outsourced, stay very much tied to discrete thermal fluctuations or heat waves or heat events. Secondly, by prescribing broad and ill-informed actions and disregarding intersectional vulnerabilities, these kinds of actions perpetuate pre-existing inequalities and they remain social spatially exclusive. And this farce we, we claim is reproduced every time that the Met Department issues a new heat wave alert for the city and the same kinds of actions then ensue. Um, next. So what does Karachi's future thermopolitics look like? We observe uh, a misinformed understanding of heat as well as of contemporary urban inequalities. We note how Karachi's thermopolitics is marked by an evasion and an unsolicited delegation, an unsolicited delegation of responsibility by the state outwards and downwards. Thirdly, we bring to light the deeper moral implications for such heat inaction, uh, which we posit is purely cosmetic or palliative in nature, and hence it is ineffective by being non-replicable or non-scalable in the longer term over time. So I will stop here and I will hand over to Alok. Thank you. Thank you so much, Adam. Uh, and thanks, Nasheen, and thanks, Lisa, uh, for convening the forum. It's really nice uh, uh, to be in conversation, to read each other's work, and be in conversation with others who are working on related issues. Um, what I think um, much of what I have to say has probably already been said uh, by different uh, speakers. Um, and at this point, I'm probably just going to uh, uh, restate many of the observations uh, that many of the observations and arguments that have already been made. Um, I'll just, for uh, those who haven't had a chance yet, I will start by just introducing uh, our contribution to the uh, uh, to this spotlight series, um, this is work that has been done also as part of the GS GCRF project that Adam mentioned, the Cool Infrastructures Project, uh, along with colleagues here in Hyderabad, uh, Anand Mangati, who Nasheen introduced earlier, um, and a large research team, two of whom have got Anish Gupta and Tanaya uh, Bobal to have co-authored this particular spotlight essay with me. Um, uh, in this space, we talk about the work we have been doing in the context of an urban informal settlement in the city of Hyderabad um, to think about uh, what does, um, and to really maybe ethnographically flesh out um, some of the uh, uh, points that may, uh, the, uh, uh, some of the points that Chandi made earlier, especially about uh, the way uh, heat uh, impact, the risk burden of heat, as well as the adaptive capacity of heat is um, unequally distributed. Um, and what we do here is then, in particular informal settlement, which came up uh, uh, somewhere around the turn of the century, to think about what, like, what is, what is the impact of heat. And, uh, we start by documenting just the material conditions of the like of the built environment uh, in this particular settlement, which is largely comprised of uh, very makeshift kind of materials. And so as what are locally called asbestos sheets or uh, cement sheets, uh, poorly ventilated, poorly laid out, um, but also because they uh, 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 they lie on they occupy land. Uh, 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 illegally, uh, it also means that uh, the space is infrastructurally underserviced and in, in, in a some, somewhat erratic fashion. So water provision, for instance, uh, is a particularly strong issue um, where water is delivered to tankers by the city uh, every other day rather than having access to pipe water. Uh, electricity connections are illegally metered um, and, and uh, waste collection simply doesn't happen. Um, and so in, within these spaces, how might one think about uh, uh, heat uh, adaptation? Right? Um, and what we also know from extensive surveys as well as uh, uh, 
I know this is work that Naushin and colleagues have also done in Karachi, uh, but we actually know that uh, a lot of the indoor spaces in the settlement are significantly warmer than the outdoor spaces. And so contrary to much of the advice that one might get from heat action plants uh, of staying indoors during extreme heat events, uh, we actually know that it is potentially safe to in some ways to stay outside in shaded spaces. And we find out also through interviews and through documentation that uh, access to shade becomes a significant issue in this particular community. Right. Um, so what we are thinking about, um, and so in contrast to the heat action plants in India, which have been now discussed a few times over, uh, we then began to think about the disconnects between what have been imagined as uh, how heat should be governed and how heat should be managed, um, uh, and instead start thinking about like what are the actual practices through which people are adapting. What is like where in, we know that communities are already um, uh, uh, there's already um, knowledge as well as. Uh, 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 um, experience about heat adaptation that is already present on the ground. Uh, and so much like Chan uh, said earlier, like how do we then begin to think about community-led heat adaptation plants, which recognizes the capacity of citizens uh, of, of, of these vulnerable groups uh, to, uh, in some ways, uh, uh, um, uh, uh, participate in uh, these governance efforts. Okay? Um, so and I think in all, what we uh, 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 like uh, emphasize in the piece then is to think about moving away from a, a disaster imagination of heat to thinking about uh, relief or uh, like thinking about uh, differential vulnerabilities to thinking about um, vulnerability uh, 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 risk distribution and vulnerability mapping and, uh, and how these might become integral to uh, heat governance efforts going ahead. I, let me stop there for now, but I'm happy to then take up further, um, like say specific things about the um, about the work that we have done, but also looking forward to the conversation that happens, uh, that unfolds um, with the other panelists. Thank you so much, Alok. Um, and uh, Lisa, please jump in. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you um, for inviting me to speak, Naushin. I'm Liza Weinstein. I'm one of the editors of the International Journal of Urban and Regional Research and the handling editor who has worked closely with Naushin and with the authors of the Spotlight On collection to produce what I think is a really essential uh, conversation. In many ways, um, I sort of feel like we've joined a conversation that is already in play and a conversation that I hope we will continue to contribute to. And so I can take this um, brief opportunity to encourage um, continued conversations. Um, I think these authors have generated really important insights. And um, I'd like to invite other authors to think about beyond, to think really beyond the, um, the technocratic or the sort of climatic scientific implications to the sociopolitics of um, heat exposure and extreme heat um, at the city level. So one of the insights that I found really um, powerful about this collection as it was coming together, and I think it really came across very nicely in today's comments, is the comparative angles um, to really think that even in a region like South Asia, um, there are so many varied um, climactic regions, ecological regions, but also comparative between historical and contemporary dynamics, as well as um, between um, different scales or units of analysis from the regional level to the city scale to the neighborhood level, as I look just um, laid out to us. Um, and I think this could be a really good opportunity as we, um, we have about 20 minutes or so left for questions um, to give the authors an opportunity to um, ask one another questions and facilitate something of a discussion across the panelists, because um, I think we've learned really distinct things, um, but also beginning to contribute to a, a body of thought across the, the region. So um, I just want to 
close my brief comments today by thanking everyone for your participation, encourage further submissions to the International Journal of Regional, uh, Regional Research. Um, this is a topic that we're going to have to continue to be discussing and debating and learning from for many years to come, I'm afraid, um, but also now to invite um, questions and comments across um, the speakers. Thank you so much, Lisa. Yeah, so let's 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 dive into any comments and questions that the speakers have for each other. That would be wonderful. And uh, and then after we take about ten minutes on that, and then uh, I will uh, uh, address. Uh, I'll I'll highlight the questions that have come up in the Q and A. So uh, so for the speakers themselves, please, whatever are your stream of thought? Can I go first? Absolutely. Yeah, so uh, I have a question for Dr. Chandni, sort of like uh, regarding this, uh, because we did, you did talk about uh, vulnerability assessments, and uh, as a as a researcher who work uh, in that specific domain, uh, sometimes I don't. I wonder most often when I see uh, like pieces uh, where scholarship pieces or like practice uh, documents where these assessments are done, uh, these are often sort of like replica of these quantitative assessments that are done in Global North. And so uh, so what do you think, like how do you think these kind of assessments would be geared towards uh, South Asian cities? Because uh, we did talk about different historical, socioeconomic and different other contexts that is completely different uh, we have in our cities, right? So do you have any insight on how should we should be doing such kind of vulnerability assessment so that we can actually reflect on the real or nuanced understanding of heat, uh, heat impacts that is happening in our communities? And I think like, I know Dr. Alok and Dr. Adam also did talk about much in a greater extent. So, I mean, you guys can ch chime in as well. Thanks so much, Ajay. I think uh, this is a challenge and I have actually been advocating to move away from vulnerability assessments to actually start thinking about more holistic, multidimensional risk assessments, which has hazard exposure and vulnerability, which is what the IPCC's risk propeller framework is. So that would mean actually that quantitative, more geospatial analysis of the hazard and the built form of cities that can happen uh, to understand hazard and exposure. And perhaps our vulnerability assessments are where we, we move away from these quantitative assessments of just using some census data and having, you know, uh, these uh, these uh, sort of vulnerability hotspots. In some ways, I think they are, of course, deployed by policymakers because it's sort of a... Uh, uh, you can you can tick box that you've done the vulnerability assessment and therefore have mapped it and you've sort of... Uh, labeled certain people and certain neighborhoods vulnerable, but we know very well that there's so much differentiation within those even high vulnerable or low vulnerable areas. So one of the things one can do, of course, is have composite uh, in, uh, you know, hazard exposure and vulnerability. And then perhaps which some cities in India actually are doing now um, in their heat action plans, at least they suggest that having recurrent vulnerability assessments to capture that dynamic nature. So no one is staying static in one particular vulnerability level. And there's movement in that. How do we understand that? But beyond that, I feel also from the solution side, we need to have more dynamic ideas of what solutions will look like. Just putting in a cooling center or a water kiosk in one place and then saying that we have adapted is not going to work. Our solutions also have to shift. Um, yeah. And maybe since I have the whatever so-called mic, I also wanted to actually, uh, what struck me a lot in this whole conversation was we, uh, there are some places and some cities in South Asia that are these, the usual suspects that repeatedly get spoken of in terms of both uh, facing a lot of heat and then also providing solutions like the Ahmedabad example or uh, others and Jakobabad and Delhi coming up as these places of high heat. But from Sajini's work, I think this whole thing of mountain uh, cities and hill towns, I think is something we need to think of. Also, this, uh, I mean, there's one thing that they, they are extremely, I mean, they're seeing the increasing hazard of heat, but also cascading, other cascading impacts, so health impacts. 
the rise of dengue and just vector-borne diseases in some of these towns because of increasing temperatures. In the IPCC report, we managed to say with high confidence, actually, that uh, dengue and malaria are spreading to um, uh, the lower Himalayas, at least in India and Nepal. How are heat action plans thinking about such cascading impacts across sectors? I think we're nowhere near that. And I, I really wonder what people think about some of these plans that we currently have that are very insufficient for the kind of problem we, we see. No, actually, as as we talk, we talk about this, many cities in Nepal are going through dengue fe fever episodes, and we are seeing lots of hospital hospitalizations and lots of other issues happening. And we never had dengue fever in the mid uh, hilly region and mainly in the capital area. Southern Plains, yes, we did had uh, we, uh, a dengue fever. So. I think at this time, our, at least in Nepal context, I can speak, it's really unidirectional. Every time we talk about heat, we separate heat from other issues. We don't think it as a cross-cutting issues and how it touches on other other different areas. Uh, so uh, that that is the reason, like every time, you know, I start to wonder about our heat action plan, which is not many. I mean, you know, there are many cities and many towns and like, and mainly in the cities, we have like a couple of heat action plan and we are not even thinking about towns. And because towns are areas which are highly underdeveloped, uh, like people do not have many adaptive resources that many uh, major urban hilly areas or even like some areas of Southern Plain has. So how we are even thinking about those areas, we do not have those kind of resources. And with climate change, we cannot just say that major urban areas which have urban heat island issues are gonna have more extreme heat events. Yes, that's true, but what about the other areas? Yes, maybe they do not have urban heat island, but the temperature extreme gonna hit those areas. And we are no ne nowhere near thinking about how we are going to provide them adaptive resources or even like heat mitigative resources moving forward. So yeah, it's really interesting. Can I just add a quick point um, to um, Chandni's point? I mean, I feel like this kind of multi-scalar thinking or interrelated approach towards health or the environment is um, I mean, it is lacking not only in the context of South Asia, but when we look at medicine and, you know, kind of treating disease, we just saw during COVID, right, and, and the history of medicine that you focus on the germ theory and try to kind of, you know, address that instead of thinking about how bodies are porous and related with the environment. So, so yeah, I mean, definitely that needs to be done, but that has its own history of how that came about to be, you know, that kind of localized idea of health and body. And it is always valuable to kind of look at interrelations and how one affects the other in practice. I okay. have something. So, sorry. Yeah, Adam, go ahead, yeah. because then I'd okay. like to jump to I, the Q&A uh, questions. Yeah, go ahead, Adam. Okay. I, I just have something to add to uh, Sajani's question and what Chani was mentioning and also what Ashwai just uh, pointed to is this idea of a, like a multi-dimensional kind of understanding of what constitutes heat in this in this specific instant in this specific moment, right? And there are multiple kinds of trajectories that are leading to to heat as it as it is manifesting right now. So these are genealogically like what kind of power sources uh, you know kind of contribute to the experience of heat? What kind of historical developments? What kind of uh, zoning and land use exclusion have led to this kinds of habitation patterns that then generate these kinds of thermal experiences um, and of course that that goes beyond just capturing these data in numbers and surveys and also only through qualitative assessments or individual anecdotal account, accounts um, so I'll just give a small example of what we're trying to do um, here in Karachi is we're trying to understand kind of build an understanding of this at various scales in terms of individual trajectories from the house to the work site to back to the recreation and, and then to back to the house for let's say informal outdoor workers then we're trying to see how uh, you know the multiple zones or the multiple for informal settlements in the city have developed over time so there, there are multiple scales of visualizing or understanding the trajectories uh, in terms of indicators that you can prioritize or deprioritize according to the, the domain of knowledge that you you know are more um, focused on but it also helps to and this links back to my article as well in which we talk about you know 
distributing or dis the disbursement of accountability and responsibility, right? So if you're talking about, let's say, I don't know, maybe rep reparations for thermal injustices or thermal harm in the, in the future, what what would be the mechanism or the framework through which you can derive or arrive at these uh, propositions? Um, so just wanted to add that. So, okay. So if if there are no more comments, uh, questions from uh, speakers for each other, for one another, what I'd like to do is just, we, ha we have about 10 minutes left. So I'd like to address the questions, to highlight the questions in our q and I'd like to start with a question posed by Nivaj Prakash, who is a doctoral student from JNU. And although he addresses this question specifically to Chani, I think it pertains to everyone. And the, his questions, his question has two dimensions. Uh, the first I mentioned is that um, about the HAPs in India and that in the context of the socioeconomic complexities uh, that are pervasive across, um, across society, does India have HAPs specifically for what he calls the lower order of the society? And alongside that, uh, the second aspect of his question is that have the panelists, the speakers observed any instances where heat wave is becoming a political issue amongst the people or becoming part or an issue of their politics. So, um, uh, Chani, you can jump in or Alok can jump in, uh, jump in or even a Shavari for the Indian context itself and maybe on politics itself. Um, even our speakers from Pakistan and uh, Nepal can uh, highlight perhaps. Uh, thanks for that question. And I think just very quickly to say, I think, uh, I mean, we have done a full assessment of around 40 Indian heat action plans. And actually, I was I was surprised, pleasantly surprised that they do acknowledge to quite a great extent that there are different um, heat risk is differentiated by livelihood type. So whether you're an indoor, outdoor worker, what types of jobs like garment uh, uh, factory workers, those kinds of things. So there's a lot of there is some nuance, I think, in acknowledging that heat risk is differentiated for different livelihoods and for different economic classes. So that is great. But then when you look at the solutions that the heat actions plan, heat action plans propose, that nuance that they started with is somehow lost. And the solutions are very generic. They, they are also um, uh, not at various scales. So I feel that while there is an acknowledgement that different socioeconomic classes are facing heat differentially, it's not then being replicated in the solutions, at least in the Indian apps. Thank you very much, Anni. Uh, uh, Nevash, I hope that answers. Uh, does anybody want to comment on the, pol the political aspect? And uh, sort of. So just very quickly, I mean, the most obvious example that comes to mind is uh, last summer when the platform drivers suddenly started with no, the No AC campaign uh, here in Hyderabad, which was in the peak of the summer because uh, the fuel prices were going up. And, uh, and, and so at, at some point, uh, they were refusing to turn, turn on the air conditioning in the cars uh, unless uh, people were willing to pay more. And so I just communicated the issue uh, right at the, like this is right uh, at the moment of the, the Ukraine invasion. So I think the like the one place where I do see it, that heat itself became the uh, like um, vehicle through which other kinds of issues were also then being highlighted uh, as a um, political mobilization. It was making political mobilization possible. Uh, that's one. Uh, I think I I need to rush, uh, but in the other thing I will add with the HAP is also is in a, a part of it is uh, I think the uh, uh, I, what we also need, I think, significantly more work um, uh, and understanding of is like the work that HAPs actually do. Because uh, in terms of like the actual ways in which it fits with governance systems, and uh, right, is something that we don't actually really know much about yet. And that varies, and that will like have a huge kind of uh, uh, impact in terms of saying uh, and, and thinking about say how town, how small towns work versus how a city like Hyderabad works and where like something like a heat action plan like who is going to be responsible for the decision making how is going to be implemented and so on so it's partly a question about like what does plan say and do not say but also then partly a question of where it is fitting uh, within the larger political administrative decision making infrastructure um, thanks everyone it's been a great conversation and I look forward Thank to Thank you, Alok.
Thank you. So, uh, so folks, we've still got about six to seven minutes left. Anvi, am I correct in my time timing? Timing. So yeah, uh, yeah. Okay. So I'll, another question uh, from Ayushi Sharma, and uh, Ayushi asks: There are so many talks around gender sensitive heat action plans. How far have we reached in this area uh, in the global south? And then, secondly. Uh, humidity is increasingly playing a pivotal role in heat stress, but most of the global south countries solely rely on temperature-based warnings. So some discussion around this would be helpful and how governments can incorporate these dimensions for early warning. So this uh, usually is uh, split in two parts. So I invite any of our speakers to address uh, either both or any one aspect of this, perhaps to start off with the gender sensitive heat action plan part. I can quickly start us off uh, just in the interest of time. I think, uh, again, I'm going to give examples from India. The heat action plans actually do show some recognition that, again, there is a uh, gendered uh, vulnerability and therefore risk is based on gender differences. So they talk about lactating and pregnant uh, women and um, how they are differentially exposed to heat. But again, the solutions don't replicate this. So you've got you've got some recognition of gender vulnerability, but then actually nothing in the the targeting of adaptation strategies. So that's that's uh, I think uh, missing. Uh, just one more thing, I think on the humidity point. Till last year, if I'm not, or oh, yeah, till last year, India actually uh, only focused on. Um, temperature thresholds and extremes above a certain amount for different regions. But uh, from this year onwards, uh, we have been, uh, our Indian Meteorological Department has actually been putting out uh, uh, temperature and humidity index. And this is still experimental. It's being piloted, but th there has been movement. And I think it's also, it's easy for us to sometimes criticize uh, our MET departments and say, why aren't they giving us these warnings that have a heat index? But it's also difficult. The heat indexes for different places are different and you have to have localized temperature threshold. So the science also around it uh, and the capacities within our med departments is also a, a stumbling block. I think IMD, in fact, is doing quite a phenomenal job given given the constraints it has, yeah. Uh, would anybody else like to jump in on this question? That uh, yeah, I think... Sharma has posed, yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, so Jan. yeah, I think same uh, for Nepal. Yeah, there is some sort of like acknowledgement regarding gender and the impact heat has but uh like uh like dr johnny was mentioning it's like really generic and there is no sort of like addressing those concerns in the solution or the action plan uh in an explicit way uh, that addresses these uh differential impacts uh, in terms of uh humidity based uh temperature reading like heat index uh no, we are still, like you mentioned, we are still on the temperature and ambient temperature reading. We are we are not even close to sort of like, you know, delivering messages regarding what is the difference between ambient temperature versus what is the difference between heat index and how the temperature reading in your cell phone or like, you know, the temperature warning that is being provided by government is different from how you feel. Uh, in Nepal, we are in the very, very initial stage where the early warning system just states that, okay, tomorrow it's going to be hot make yourself like just be inside your home or do whatever you can just don't go out so we are not even you know uh in the in the place where we talked about in in much greater detail on like how we should be addressing these so I'll just stop here I know we do have time limitation uh okay yeah I think uh, Tami, I think we've run out of time haven't we oh okay so we uh, have about two minutes no she we have two minutes to just wrap okay up. yeah all right. So, uh, so I would like to wrap up first of all by thanking all our wonderful speakers who have contributed to uh, the recently published Spotlight issue in Iger, and uh, these are incredible essays, um, you know, ranging from um, sort of very on ground um, readings and uh, empirical engagements on what heat action plans look like on ground and. Uh, what does it mean when we talk about community-oriented heat action plans? And here I'm thinking of the work of Alok and his colleagues. And uh, and and then uh, ranging to Ashavari's uh, wonderful work that really brings the historical aspects of the relationship between the body, the environment, and, uh, and temperature and heat and so forth. 
And um, for those for, for those participants uh, who people who have attended this uh, uh, session today, I encourage you to read the essays uh, because they really open up new vistas in terms of how we think about heat beyond just the technocratic aspect of, of temperatures. So thanking all our speakers and thanking our audience. I'm sorry that we don't have time to go through all the questions. I wish that we did and, uh, and really appreciate all of you for joining us today. And thank you Tanvi and especially IHS for sponsoring this event and thank you Lisa as always. That spotlight is out there and is so easily accessible and not behind a paywall as, uh, as far as IJO is concerned. Take care everyone and hope you have a wonderful week. Bye-bye. Thanks, Rashim. Bye.